Good morning. Good morning. Today, today's um, title of the sermon is From Darkness to Light. Amen. And it's taken from uh, a story in the Bible, Mark chapter 10, about a man who was born blind called Bartimaeus, who Jesus miraculously healed. Darkness to light is something uh, I've known about the last few days. We've been out without power for three days, so we've been in darkness uh, quite a lot of the time. And hopefully we're going to move into light pretty quick. So uh, this story is recorded in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52, which is where we'll be reading it from. But it's also in Matthew 20, 29 to 34, and Luke 18, 35 to 43. But we will read it in Mark's account. So Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Well, there we are. There's the scene. There's Jesus. He's been all through Israel the last uh, three years, just over, healing the sick, delivering demon-possessed, calming the storm, walking on water, performing man fantastic miracles wherever he went. And now we see him turning his face to Jerusalem, and he arrives at Jericho, a city which is about... 18 miles or so northeast of Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die for the sins of mankind. And it's interesting for me to when I read this that this miracle was actually the last miracle of healing recorded in the book of Mark. We don't see another one. He's preached the word, he's told people who he is, he's told people to repent and believe in him, he's confirmed it with signs and wonders. There's nothing left for him to do now but to go to the cross and complete the deal, which is his blood, his life, for our salvation. And that's exactly what he did. It's also interesting in verse 46 to see that he's called the son of Timaeus. Well, Bar Timaeus means son of Timaeus, which the Jews would have known because Bar means son of. But of course, Mark wasn't writing to the Jews, was he? He was writing to the Gentiles, mainly to the Romans. And so he makes it clear he was the son of Timaeus. It's also interesting to note that this is the only man who Jesus physically healed whose name is recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Nobody else's name who is healed is actually recorded. Now, there's been some conjecture why that is. Maybe because Bartimaeus went on to achieve some notoriety in his Christian walk with Jesus. And when Mark wrote this uh, account, his name would have been probably well known. Uh, maybe that's why his name is named. But the principal reason, really, for this story is that Bartimaeus represents all of us before we knew Christ spiritually blind and just sitting by the roadside spiritually blind now look, we may not be physically blind but the bible says that we are born spiritually blind and we're kept that way by the god of this world he keeps us captive satan it says without being born again 
by the Spirit of God. We cannot see the things of God because we are spiritually blind. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he's blinded us. And as Christ calls us, he starts to give us spiritual sight. But we don't have it when we're born. We're born completely blind. The Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, because we're blind in our natural form, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot see them or know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But when God starts to call us, when he starts to make his presence known in our life, we start to get spiritual vision. And that's all of God. He gives it to us. He starts to open our eyes. So although we may not see, be able to see physically, we may be able to see physically, we are born spiritually blind to the kingdom of God. And we cannot see Jesus for who he is, the light of the world, in whom there is no darkness at all. We need Jesus to open our spiritual eyes so that we can see the kingdom of God. Now, there was a short story written by H.G. Wells that some of you may know called The Country of the Blind. It's an interesting story. It's about a mountaineer who goes up a steep mountain in Ecuador and he falls down the other side. And the other side of this massive mountain is this land, it's a fictitious story, where everybody is blind. There was an earthquake many years before, thousands of years before, and they were completely cut off from the rest of the world. It's an interesting story. And everybody is blind, but this mountaineer falls down and he can see. So he's the only one who can see. And uh, these people have adapted to live in a way that is blind. A disease struck them thousands of years before, and they started to go gradually blind until in the end all their babies were born completely blind. So generation after generation went by, and everybody was blind, to the point where they didn't believe in sight anymore, because generations had gone by where nobody could ever see. So they were completely blind. They had adapted their world. They had no windows in their houses. They didn't divide the day in a clock. They divided it between, I think it was warmth and cold. So that's day and night for people who can see. But for them, it was warmth and cold. They had like little notches on their streets instead of names so they could feel where they were. So they completely adapted. And they had had myths about sight. Some people talked of sight and they thought they were mad. They couldn't believe it. They thought, no, that's a myth. No one can see. We, we know there's a, a myth about it. And they would have philosophers to explain the phenomenon of sight, to say how bizarre it is that some people do believe in sight. Anyway, this mountaineer falls into this land, and he's the only one who can see. And so he says, there is such a thing as sight. People can see. And they start to counsel him. And they start to feel sorry for him. And then they think he's a bit stupid. And they think there's something wrong with his brain. And in the end, they get angry with him. And in the end, they want to gouge these puffy organs out the middles of, the, of, their, of his head, which are eyes. They say they want to gouge them out because they're the source of the problem. So it's possible to live in a world in this story where everybody is blind except for one. Now, I tell you that story because, in a way... The natural man is born blind to the things of God. And it's only when Christ opens our eyes that we can see. And therefore it's quite hard for us to tell people who have not had their eyes opened about spiritual sight in the same way as in this story. And in our story about blind Bartimaeus, God was opening his spiritual eyes as well as his physical eyes. Bartimaeus could actually see much better than all the crowd around him even though he was the only one who was physically blind. They were spiritually blind. They had physical sight, but they didn't have spiritual sight. Verse 47, Bartimaeus had faith that the man others called Jesus of Nazareth, he knew to be Jesus, the son of David. Did you notice that? They told him it was Jesus of Nazareth, but he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me the Messiah, the son of David, the saviour of the world. 
the one who could bring deliverance and freedom, the one who could deliver us from the curse of blindness, the one who could open our eyes and take us out of darkness and into a world of light. You see, God was opening his eyes, his spiritual eyes. He called him Jesus, the son of David, not what he was told, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he had never seen a single miracle. Bartimaeus never saw a single miracle, and yet he believed. He had good hearing. Someone must have told him about Jesus being the son of David, the Messiah, the one prophesied to come long before, to bring freedom to the oppressed and to set at liberty long-held captives. Someone told him the truth about Jesus. Somebody testified to Bartimaeus who Jesus really was. Somebody must have told him. And of course, the question for us is, have we a friend that is blind to Jesus? Is there a son or a daughter? Is there a work colleague that is sitting by the roadside begging? You may wonder why they don't believe. Why do they not have faith? Maybe you can see it. Maybe God has opened your eyes. But why can they not see it? The Bible gives us the answer, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So the Bible makes it very clear why people don't believe. They have to hear the gospel message. Yes, we can show them by our lives, but it's the gospel message they must hear. Now, brothers and sisters, you might say, well, that's great, I'll bring them to a preacher who can tell them. But I must tell you, we are all commissioned to tell people of Jesus. We are all commissioned to preach. Preaching is just telling someone about Jesus, who he is. You know, Jesus' parting words to those that believed in him were, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He wasn't creating just preachers at the front of a church. He was creating preachers out in the community, ordinary believers, to tell people about Jesus. Now, you may have said, well, uh, uh, I've told told people, the same person about Jesus, many, many times. But God might say, tell them again. Tell them again. Thank goodness that somebody told Bartimaeus about Jesus. We don't know how many times he was told that Jesus was the Messiah, but he believed it. And also, how many times did people tell me about Jesus before I believed? Many, many times. I thank God there was a family across the road that told me about Jesus over and over and over and over again. And a work colleague. Don't be discouraged when someone doesn't believe. Tell them again. Verse 48. Notice how Bartimaeus' faith persevered when it met obstacles. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. You see, when you knock on heaven's door, they hear it in hell, and they do everything they can to stop you getting in. They hear it in hell. There's principalities and powers that hear it, and they stop you. They try and stop you from getting to the kingdom of God. Now, we have a German shepherd at home, some of you may know, and he's friendly as anything when he's outside. You could meet him along the road, give him a stroke and a pat, he'd wag his tail, he absolutely loves everybody. But if you knock on my door at home, he goes absolutely ballistic. His hackles are up, his eyes intimidatingly focus, he barks repetitively, and people are generally and probably quite rightly frightened because he would bite. Suddenly, when the door is knocked, his hackles are up. And that's what it's like when you're being drawn to Christ or when God wants you to do something. When God calls... They hear it in hell. Don't be surprised when you knock on heaven's door, the hackles of the hounds of hell will go up. Their eyes will fix on you. 
They will try and intimidate you and they will show their teeth. The good thing, though, is that the soul awakened by God will be drawn to him despite the opposition because it's all of God. There will be a compelling and irresistible pull towards God for the true believer. He will be brought out of darkness and into God's marvelous light in accordance with his word and his will. Now we have, uh, as well as the dog, we have birds at home. And uh, we keep them in one room in the house. Oh, my wife does, I have nothing to do with them. <laughs> so they're there, all in one room. But sometimes one escapes. Now, we can do whatever we can to try and catch this bird, and it will not go back into the room of where it's safe, and where it's got its food, and where it's warm and bright. It just won't do it. We chase it all around the house. It'll even fly itself into a window and knock itself out and all the rest of it. It just won't do it. Think how stupid. It's the only place where it's safe and it won't go. But if we turn all the lights off in the house, except for the room that it's due to go in, where it belongs, and leave a light on in there, it will be drawn inexorably to that light and to that room and to that safety where there's food and where there's water, and where there's protection, and where they're safe. And that's what it's like with God when he calls us. He starts to show us the darkness in our life, and he shows us the light of where he is, the light of the world, and we're drawn into that room where there's safety, where there's food, where there's water, and where we will be safe. And it's the same, isn't it, with the sinner who sees the Saviour. When we saw the Saviour when we were first saved, can you remember? Suddenly, light. If others would put him off, he will persevere. Look at our example, Bartimaeus. If others didn't know the misery of blindness, Bartimaeus did, and he would not be stopped. The others didn't know, Bartimaeus knew. Your thing may not be blindness. Yours may be depression. Yours may be addiction to something. You may have a life-controlling thing. If others can't see the blackness and the darkness of it, you can. But you won't let it stop you coming to Christ. Because God does the work. God calls you. Now, if others only saw the son of Na Joseph from Nazareth, Bartimaeus saw the son of David from heaven. He saw something different to the people around him. People around him might just see Jesus as just an ordinary man, a good teacher, maybe a prophet. But when you're drawn to Christ, you see him as the Messiah, the son of David. If others held on to their cloaks and their positions, Bartimaeus cast his off, didn't he? He threw aside his cloak. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus, verse 50. Others might want to hold on to their possessions, to the things that they're familiar with. But the man called to Christ will cast it aside. If others thought it foolish to cry out to Jesus to see, Bartimaeus cared not. He knew that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wasn't too proud to cry out to Jesus. He didn't care if he looked stupid. He didn't care if people told him, be quiet. No. He knew, because God put it in his heart, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the message is, do not be intimidated by those that will seek to keep you from calling out to Jesus. You're not listening to this by accident. God is calling you to call out to Jesus. You may hear voices that say you're too young. You're too old, you're too busy, you're too intelligent, you're too simple, you're too bad, you're too good, you're going too far, you're too extreme, you're spending too much time in prayer, you're spending too much time reading his word. This is all the spirit of the world seeking to keep you in darkness. It's all those hounds of hell. And it's all lies. And one day it'll be too late. Go to the light of the world. He's the only one who can illuminate our poor, destitute, blind spirits. He can breathe new life where there's death. 
Cry out to him like Bartimaeus. That's real prayer. Cry out to him in desperation, aware of your need. You don't need to say a set written prayer. You don't need to recognize anything other than your need of him. That's all you need. A desire to know him, to meet him. And then to cry out to him, regardless of what anyone else says. Because God says, I will hear when they call to me. He says, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. It takes all your heart. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is God's promise. And we can trust it. And he's put it in writing. Now let's look at verse 49. Jesus stopped and said, call him. Now if Jesus stopped for a poor blind beggar and called him when he heard his desperate cry, don't you think he will stop and he will call for you? I mean, he stopped for the tax collector. He stopped for the woman caught in the act of adultery. He stopped for the simple fisherman. And he'll stop for you. You see, it's not enough to sit idly by the wayside as Jesus passes by in the hope that he might stop for you. Oh, I hope he'll stop for me. He's passing by. You're hearing about him. You're drawn to him. He's passing by. I hope he'll stop. It's not enough to trust in fate. Oh, if God wants to save me, then he'll have to do something. He'll have to appear. He'll have to speak to me in some audible voice. Trust in fate. Whatever will be, will be. No. We must cry out to him. We must recognize our need and cry out to him. That's repentance. It's essential. We have to do that. We have to repent. Then he will stop and he will call to us. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Jesus is passing by. Don't leave it to another time before calling out to him. He may have passed by. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. We don't know if we've got tomorrow. Proverbs 29.1 says and warns, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Think about that. Many, many times you hear the gospel message. Many, many times you've resisted. You've hardened your neck. The Bible says suddenly you can be destroyed and that without remedy. Who knows if we have tomorrow. Cry out to him like Bartimaeus did. See, Jesus hears the cry of a soul desperate for him. He stops. Bartimaeus was desperate. He, Jesus does not ignore. He does not become deaf to our cries. He is not distant and aloof. He stops for the poor, poor blind sinner. Even though he was on his way to Jerusalem to complete what had been laid down since the foundation of the world and which will last for all eternity, dying on the cross, even though he was on his way to do that, just 18 miles from it, within a week he would have completed that task. He would have died on the cross. It had taken him just over three years to get to this point. We've had ten chapters of Mark where it's been explaining him coming to this point. And there's 16 chapters in Mark, so there's six more chapters on the last week. So it's important what he's about to do, but he stops for the poor blind beggar. Now if he'll stop for the poor blind beggar, even though he's about to complete the greatest thing that has ever occurred in all eternity, won't he stop for you? Of course he will. By the way, notice in verse 49 that he didn't call directly to Bartimaeus on this occasion. I noticed that. He didn't say, Bartimaeus, come to me. On this occasion, he asked his followers to call him, didn't he? He asked his followers to call him. There's a lesson here for us, isn't there? Is God asking you to call someone? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he'll lay a name on your heart. Sometimes you'll see somebody by the roadside, perhaps someone you know, perhaps someone you don't know, and he'll lay that person on your heart to call. 
He puts individuals on our hearts. And he says, call him. And because the followers of Jesus in our reading were obedient, they did call Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus came to Jesus and he was given sight because they responded to Jesus saying, call him. A miracle occurred because somebody was obedient to the voice of God that said, call him. And let's look at verse 50, Bartimaeus' response to the call. Bartimaeus' response to the call of Jesus was to cast off his security. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. <clears throat> now you might not think that is much, but this man probably had virtually nothing else. Don't forget, in those days, it wasn't about going to Primark and getting a coat for £10. A cloak would have been a very valuable thing back then. Didn't they cast a lot for Jesus' cloak? Didn't Paul, I think, at one point ask for his cloak to be brought? These were valuable items. This is probably the, the most valuable thing that this man had. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. He cast off his security. He made himself vulnerable in coming to Jesus. Because he's blind. Once he's thrown his cloak aside, he may never find it again. He can't see. He came to Jesus. He didn't want that cloak getting tangled up in his feet as he came to Jesus. He didn't want any encumbrance in coming to Jesus. He didn't want to put his faith in anything other than Jesus. And so it must be with us. We must burn our boats. We must have no plan B. We must come to him as we are, with no reliance on our goodness, which God does view as filthy rags, compared to his holiness. No reliance on our achievements of what we own. You can't buy your way into the kingdom of God. We heard that a couple of weeks ago with the rich young ruler. Simply trusting in his call to us. You see, his call is the most valuable thing in all eternity, really, for us. And if you hear it, don't ignore it. It's the most valuable thing you could ever hear. As one hymn writer put it, naked come to him for dress, helpless look to him for grace. And the same is true for believers as well. It's not just for people that are still to believe. It's for believers. If we want a closer walk with him, we must cast off everything that hinders us, throw off our cloak, everything that entangles us, and run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, with our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. That's what it says in it? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Now let's look at verse 51. Verse 51, we see that Bartimaeus comes to Jesus and, ask, and asks, Jesus asks Bartimaeus the same, the same question as he asked James and John back in verse 36, which we read last week, didn't he? What do you want me to do for you? That's exactly the same wording as he said to James and John in verse 36 of this same chapter. So he says exactly the same thing to Bartimaeus. However, the contrast in their motives and in their heart attitudes on the two occasions could not be more stark. James and John's request was born out of pride and a desire for position and self-elevation. And Jesus did not grant it. He didn't do it. But Bartimaeus' request was for mercy. Have mercy on me. It was for grace for something he felt he didn't deserve. He didn't come to Jesus and said, look, all these other people can see. You're supposed to be God. It's not fair. I want to be able to see as well. No. He came to Jesus and said, have mercy on me. He asked for grace. It came from a humble and a contrite heart. Psalm 51, 17 tells us that a broken and a contrite heart, God will not turn away. A broken and a contrite heart and he didn't. Bartimaeus received his healing. 
God did show mercy to him and he granted him his request. Now, um, we see, if you read this account in uh, the King James Version, uh, and in fact in Luke's account, we'll see that Bartimaeus calls Jesus Lord. And in the Revised Standard Version, he calls him Master in verse 51. So in here, in the New International, it says, Rabbi, I want to see. But in the King James, it's Lord. And then in the RSV, it's Master. And I think in the New King James, it's Rabboni. But it all means the same thing. Treating Jesus as Lord and as Master of your life. That's how we come to him. That is the attitude to approach Jesus with. And anyone who comes to Jesus with that attitude, humble, contrite, a broken heart, calling him Lord, he will never turn away. He will never turn away. Now the hounds of hell will say, he won't accept you. The hounds of hell will say, he'll turn you away. He'll reject you. But he never will. He never will. All who come to me, I will in no wise cast out, he says. In John chapter 6, I think it is. That's Jesus. Notice also in verse 52. In verse 52, we see that it was Bartimaeus' faith in Jesus as the son of David, as his deliverer and his saviour, that led him to his healing. Now, it's interesting. In verse 52, it says, Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Now, I looked up the word healed you in the Greek interlinear, and I noticed that the word healed is not the same word used to describe physical healing. It can be, but it's not specific to physical healing. Then I looked up the passage in other versions of the Bible, and I see in some it is translated, as in the King James, as whole. Your faith has made you whole. And in some translations it says your faith has saved you. So we see that it was Bartimaeus' faith in Jesus as the ultimate king that saved him. Yes, it healed him physically, but it also healed him spiritually. It saved his soul. It was his faith in Jesus as the king of kings that saved him. It wasn't his tenacity. It wasn't his power. It wasn't his intellect. It wasn't his predicament. It was his faith. And the Bible says it's only by the grace of God that we can be saved through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. This gift of God is being offered to you today. That's why you're listening to these words from God's, God's holy word. He's offering you spiritual sight as a gift and to receive it you repent and cry out to him with a broken and contrite heart and he will not turn you away that is the message of the bible and it's the message that god wants to bring to you this morning now we see also in verse 52 that jesus gave this man freedom to go his own way because in verse 52 in the New International, it says, Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. But in the King James, I think it says, um, Go your way, your faith has healed you. And that is the mood of what he originally said. He said, Go, in the sense of, Go your way. He gave him freedom to go his way after he was healed. But notice Bartimaeus, in that same verse, chose to go Jesus' way because it says immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, he could have, having received his physical sight, couldn't he, have gone back to his mother, his father, maybe his wife, who knows. He could have chosen to use his physical sight to see all the things of this world. He couldn't he? He could have gone to see all the beautiful sights of, around him. But it's interesting because 
This is the word of God and every word in there is meant for something. He chose to go Jesus' way. It says he followed Jesus along the road. And that's proof of salvation, turning your back on the world and setting your face to the cross and to Jesus, to follow Jesus. That's proof of salvation. That's just as much a miracle of salvation as anything else, that he sustains us, that he keeps us going along the road with Jesus. I sometimes look back over the last 35, 40 years of being a Christian and marvel how he has kept me on the road. It's a, miracle, it's a complete miracle, just like salvation. It's all of God. The saving and the keeping is all of God. True salvation will result on the perseverance of us as saints, because God does it. Yes, we have our free will, but God will call us and God will change us into his likeness. That is proof of salvation. The Bible says that there are actually two roads, aren't there, that we could go down. You see, Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside, it says, begging. That is the broad road that the Bible speaks of. That is the road that the natural man is born onto. That is a dark road that gets progressively darker. And at the end of that road is a judgment seat. And God is sitting on it. And it's there on that broad road that leads up to that judgment seat, that we are judged. Because after death comes the judgment, the Bible says. And it's at the end of the broad road. And it says, many there be that go in thereat. Many, most people will stay where they're born naturally, on the broad road that leads to destruction, the Bible says. Because our judgment for our sin by a holy God, can only assign us to one place, which is hell. Jesus doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to get off the broad road and onto the narrow road that leads to life. And we see that Bartimaeus got off the broad road and followed Jesus along the road. That's the narrow road that the Bible talks about. Yes, it says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but it says Narrow is the road and straight is the gate that leads to salvation and few there be that find it. Which is why if God is opening your eyes, it's such a gift. It's such a gift. Repent and receive the gift whilst Jesus is passing by. It may not be another time. He's calling you off the broad road and he's calling you onto the narrow road which leads to life, it says, because at the end of that road, which gets brighter and brighter until the full light of day, like the dawn dawning, at the end of that road is another seat. It's not a judgment seat. It's a mercy seat. And God will judge us in his mercy from that road, not according to our sins, not according to his righteousness, but according to his mercy. And he can do that because his righteousness was satisfied on the cross at Calvary. So he can do it. He can judge us according to mercy. And that's the gospel message, the good news. God's opening your eyes. God wants you to repent. God wants you to turn away from the broad road and get onto the narrow road where there's life and life forevermore, where our sinful nature is pardoned when it faces God's mercy. Well, shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for that gift that some of us have been shown and some of us have received. We're so grateful, Lord, that it keeps us on the road. We pray, Lord, that you show us people sitting along the roadside in our lives that you want us to speak to about you because faith comes by hearing. May they hear and have faith in you. Give them ears to hear. Give us ears to hear your call. And Lord, give those of us that are seeking you the tenacity and the will to push past all the hounds of hell in darkness and bring us to your marvellous light. 
Grant us the gift of spiritual sight, we pray. We know, Lord, that you will stop and call for any sinner that repents, and we've read it again today. And we thank you for stopping and for calling for us. Give those of us that need it the courage to cast off anything that will hold us back from getting on our feet, jumping to our feet, and following you. Give us the courage to stand up for you and be counted as a follower of you, like Bartimaeus did. Keep us humble, O Lord. Deliver us from seeking selfish gain, as is us apt in our sinful nature. May we always see our need for your mercy and grace as we follow you along the narrow road. Amen.